네, 안녕하세요. 저희는 컨퍼런스 2부 급진적 행동의 펠로우 세션 사회를 맡게 된 아야 불기 펠로우 박지원, 박지호입니다. 먼저 코로나로 인해서 원격으로 진행되는 이번 제2회 급진적 미래 컨퍼런스에 현장에서 그리고 유튜브로 함께 해주시고 계신 모든 분들께 진심 어린 감사 인사를 드립니다. 한 가지 공지사항이 있습니다. 더 나은 아야프를 위해 일부 참석자들을 대상으로 설문조사를 받고 있습니다. 관련 링크가 유튜브 채팅창에 올라가고 있으니 많은 참여 부탁드립니다. 네, 그리고 공지사항 하나 더 있는데요. 이제 유튜브로 시청해주고 계신 분들은 어, 조금 편할 수 있겠는데 여기 장내에 계신 펠로우 분들께서는 어, 오랜 시간 앉아계셔야 하다 보니까 조금 답답하실 수도 있을 것 같아요. 어, 그래도 그 서로 다른 펠로우들의 발표에 잘 경청해 주셨으면 어, 하는 바람이 있습니다. 네, 그리고 올해 1월에 진행된 아야프 1기로부터 약 7개월가량이 지났는데요. 그동안 저희 1기 펠로우들은 결과물을 만들어내고 어, 그리고 2기 펠로우십을 함께 준비해 왔습니다. 이렇게 1기 펠로우인 저희가 아야프라는 플랫폼에 계속해서 연결되고 참여할 수 있는 것이 아야프의 큰 매력이라고 생각합니다. 네, 이번 2회 펠로우십은 디지털 주권을 다루는 기술, 생태계 파괴를 다루는 환경, 그리고 다음 세대의 도시 권리를 다루는 도시 디자인의 총 3개 트랙으로 구성되어 있습니다. 이 3개 트랙에 참여하는 17명의 펠로우는 각기 다른 배경과 경험, 그리고 직업, 국적을 가졌지만 자신이 속한 지역에서 사회 문제를 스스로 정의하고 해결하기 위해 노력해온 경험이 있습니다. 펠로우들 모두 오늘 급진적 미래 컨퍼런스를 시작으로 향후 10일간 서로 배우며 자신의 경험을 서울 그리고 그 넘어 아시아로 확장하고자 합니다. 오늘 이 시간에는 펠로우 17명이 현재까지 활동해온 이야기와 그 다음에 앞으로 어 8일 동안 액티비스트 리서치를 어떻게 하실지에 대한 계획을 함께 들어볼 예정인데요. 들으시면서 각각의 펠로우가 액티비스트 리서처를 어떻게 생각하고 있는지 어떻게 정의하고 있는지도 어, 눈여겨보시면 좋을 것 같습니다. 네, 발표에 앞서서 제2회 아야프의 시작을 알리는 선언문 영상을 먼저 함께 보고 시작하겠습니다. 영상 틀어주세요. We currently coexist in the same storm. We are facing global problem of unprecedented scale such as the coronavirus pandemic, rapid technological change, and the climate crisis. The global nature of these issues requires global approaches. It is also more important than ever to amplify the voices of today's youth. This storm has united us as activist researchers and we will overcome it someday with our combined efforts. The world is changing very fast, but the system is not capable of supporting it. There are various colorful individual stories, but they don't get enough respect. We are youth from different backgrounds and experience. Our diversity is our strength. Our imaginations echo, creating unexpected methods for sustainable change. We are in a crisis that destroys our daily lives and there is no time to be stuck in a library, so we are here. We should be constantly questioning ourselves. Are we living to exist or are we existing to live? Together, as young professionals and researchers, we will bridge the gap between theory and practice. Together, we will thrive and strive to create the impact that changes the society for better. Together, we will make spaces which are safe and free, spaces where we can be our true selves and create the possibility of an alternative community. We believe the traditional ideas that we share today will make the future of Asia. We hope to bring about a systematic transition for securing a digital sovereignty for every citizen. We will imagine a green future where path-breaking ideas become new normal. We dream of the future Asian urban spaces where our rights resolve the gaps between people. Here in Seoul, we boldly announce the commencement of the second IR. 네, 잘 보셨나요? 네. 네, 지금 보신 시작의 선언문은 이외 아야프 펠로우들께서 직접 작성하신 것인데요. 어, 그들이 생각하는 청년 변화의 필요성 그리고 미래가 어떤 모습인지 잘 드러난 영상이었던 것 같습니다. 
네, 그럼 이제부터 각 펠로의 발표를 듣겠습니다. 발표는 각 10분이고요. 발표 순서는 아야 홈페이지에 업로드 되어 있으며 유튜브 채팅창에도 관련 링크가 올라가고 있으니 순서 확인 부탁드립니다. 또 이번에는 원격으로 진행하는 만큼 질의사항을 유튜브 채팅창을 통해 받고 있습니다. 질의사항을 유튜브 채팅창에 올려주시면 30일까지 펠로우의 답변을 받아 아야 홈페이지에 공지할 예정입니다. 지속적으로 홈페이지를 적극 참고해 주시길 부탁드립니다. 자, 그럼 이제 첫 번째 펠로우부터 소개해 보겠습니다. 네, 첫 번째로 소개해 드린 펠로우는 한소리 펠로우입니다. 한소리 펠로우는 스마트 기술을 활용하여 보다 포용적인 도시를 만들고자 하는 도시학도입니다. 이번 아야프에서는 도시에서 가장 취약한 커뮤니티의 니즈를 파악하고 스마트 기술을 통해 이러한 니즈를 충족시킬 수 있는 방안을 모색하고 있습니다. 그럼 한소리 펠로우의 발표를 듣겠습니다. 박수로 힘차게 맞아주세요. 음, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sori Han. I'm one of the re activist research fellow under the theme of uh, youth and technology. I'm going to talk, about, talk a little bit about myself, my interests, and also some questions that I'd like to answer through this second IRF. First, it's me <laughs> without this mask. Um, I'm mainly interested in the future of smart city and how this smart city can grow into an inclusive city and, worse, and the cities for all. Um, I'd like to study urban planning and also engage ICT and data analysis to make uh, inclusive smart city. All of this interest about smart city and inclusive city actually started from my undergraduate studies. Um, my, I majored in geography education, and through my major, I was able to participate in a variety of GIS projects. And these projects were mainly focused on solving urban problems that the vulnerable communities in our cities are, that, that are, they are facing. So while doing these projects, I was able to encounter some urban safety problems um, that elderly, um, handicapped, and low-income citizens are facing, and which, are, which I was not aware of before this project. So um, this became a foundation for my desire to solve these problems. And after I graduated in college, I actually worked as a geography teacher at a high school. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, while teaching my students, it was a very invaluable experience for me to um, inspire them um, about the citizen issues in urban context and also engage with them to think about the practical solutions to solve these urban safety problems. And th this actually became a, also became a foundation for me to make more immediate and, uh, and direct impacts to our city. And so <laughs> I'm currently working at Seoul Metropolitan Government um, in Smart City Policy Bureau. And as a 3D modeling consultant and designer, I'm designing the facilities um, in Seoul, such as subway stations and also public facilities like government offices. And these um, models that I design are used in two ways. First, the Seoul indoor map. Using that link, you can access, easily access to the 3D um, spatial information models. And these, uh, you can also access and download the 3D models in that link. And actually, this Seoul indoor map is used in firefighting operations right now. And secondly, it is used in virtual Seoul. And many of you would be unaware of this Thing, but it's, it's going to be open to the public next year. And through using the digital twin technology, this um, virtual soul is expected to be used in um, uh, finding the impacts of the natural disasters and also um, about the effects of the urban planning projects uh, done by Seoul. And simultaneously, I'm also an urban planning researcher. Um, as a citizen researcher, I'm doing a small research about um, the importance of inclusive smart city. And focusing on the small case of Pukjong village, as shown in the right picture, um, I'm um, working with 
<coughs> I'm collaborating, collaborating with the residents of Pukjong Village about the importance of um, inclusive smart city and how we can find a way to um, um, use utilizing living lab to solve the urban safety problems happening in that area. So um, this, that was a little bit about my story. <coughs> and, and through this education and work experience, I am um, planning to do an active, activist research on the inclusive smart city. And um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> and um, since I'm working at the Smart City Policy Bureau, I come across a lot of um, um, uh, I come across a lot of innovative ideas and usage of technologies to solve the urban problems and also um, to make our urban daily lives more easier and happier. However, the thing is, um, what I'm focusing on is that it's still lacking the um, it's still lacking the. Um, consideration of the vulnerable communities. Um, as Audrey Tang and Jin Tae Yang in the previous conference mentioned in their lecture, most of the smart city plans and initiatives are focused on, are based on data. Um, we are producing data every day and even this moment. Um, and these data become a very important foundation for the urban planners and also city governments to plan their <coughs> urban planning projects and find and analyze and solve the problems. Um, however, we have to always remember that there are still vulnerable communities who are, <coughs> who are having a hard time accessing to these um, digital, de digital devices and because of digital divide. So um, um, I'm trying to um, focus on these two questions through this two second IR. How are we going to obtain the data of the Bernal communities? And how are we going to make them feel included in the city that they are living in? Actually, that quote by Gil Penalosa, we are currently designing cities as if everyone is 30 years old and active, is one of my favorite quotes. Um, since vulnerable, com vulnerable communities are not um, easily producing their data. They are easily excluded from the process of city planning and in the process of solving the urban problems, even though they are the most, one, most vulnerable ones <coughs> uh, experiencing these urban problems. So I'd like to answer these questions by um, utilizing Living Lab and also connecting it to the ICT technology. Um, um, in the past few days, I've met some fellow, other fellows who are also interested in the Living Lab, and I hope that I could interact with them to find and analyze <coughs> the successful examples of the Living Lab with them um, through the second IR. And after, shortly after I finished second IR, I'm leaving to the New York City to start my master's degree in urban planning. And I hope to um, experience the diversity and inclusive city planning of New York City and to delve, in, to delve deeper into my interest in, in inclusive smart city. And yeah, I hope to grow as a urban planner who can find ways for a more inclusive smart city. Um, thank you for listening, and please leave comments for if you have any questions. Thank you. <웃음> 네, 다음 펠로는 아그로 알리 베실입니다. 알리는 에디오피아 출신의 도시 학도입니다. 그는 좀더 정확한 예측 모델을 기반하여 도시를 설계하고자 하는데요. 특히 기후 위기를 비롯한 재난을 예방하기 위한 방법들을 탐구하고자 합니다. 알리의 발표를 들어보도록 하겠습니다. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, team, uh, for a brief introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, it's good to see you here. And uh, I will, I'll, I'm going to uh, introduce you about myself and 
my research and my research idea here uh, during the IARF. And yeah, my name is uh, Agra Ali Bashir. I'm from Ethiopia, and I came to Korea under the Korean government scholarship program called KJSP to, to do my master's degree in urban planning and design at the University of Seoul. Uh, my BSc degree was in urban planning, uh, urban and regional planning at the Addis Ababa University back home. And for the work experience, I was a uh, research assistant in the International Urban Development and Climate Change Laboratory of the University of Seoul. Here I did, uh, I conducted research and served as uh, a teaching assistant for undergraduate courses and participated in different conferences and uh, seminars uh, representing my lab. And also I worked as an assistant lecturer back home uh, in the Department of Urban Planning and Design of uh, Addis Ababa Science and Technology University. And during this time I used to advise students and review and grade their projects and uh, try to help them to integrate geographic information system in their uh, design and planning projects. And also I worked as a GIS and photogrammetry specialist in a private company also participated in various urban planning and design projects uh, back home as uh, an urban planner and urban designer as well. So my research interests are basically focused on the issue of uh, the process of urbanization and uh, climate change and climate change induced hazard mapping and modeling and analysis and all, of course sustainable urban development is highly associated with these issues and I'm also interested in that area as well and try to uh, study the applications of the machine learning in uh, modeling and developing scenarios for the future uh, development of urban areas uh, as well and also I have some uh, peer uh, papers under peer review. Uh, my motto for uh, the IRF during my stay uh, is that to solve the problems we need to see the world clearly uh, through analyzing the past trends and learn from the past trends and move forward and predict the possible future scenarios and get ready, get prepared for the future. And to do that I have kind of uh, some kind of model for that and I call it learn and move forward model. Now we are in the present and we need to learn from the past, study the past, what, what happened in the past, analyze the past and uh, to, to, to see the trends and events that happened in the past and get ready for the future uh, and predict the future as well. So for my thesis, for my master's degree, I did like these two points. The first one is I tried to demonstrate the integration of geographic information system with uh, the statistical tools and flooding models to analyze the past urban development and predict for the future uh, urban development and flooding events and also uh, try to predict the future uh, scenarios of urban development uh, as well using artificial neural network and for my stay here I'm trying to uh, include the points here mentioned at three and four. The first one is to incorporate the social aspects of uh, hazard and what it has on the society and I, I would like to continue taking this as one stream of study. And the fourth one is like developing uh, a flexible artificial neural network model to build, to predict for the future scenarios. And why am I interested in this area is because as a person who grew up in um, a city, one of like biggest cities in Africa, which is called Addis Ababa, I have seen, I have witnessed like lots of things due to urbanization. And also this urbanization trend is expected to continue increasing for cities in developing countries uh, in less developed countries as well. And uh, so the estimated uh, and projected urbanization for the future indicates that by the UN indicates that this red line indicates that most of the urbanization in the future until 2050, 90% of it is going to happen in cities in Africa and South Asia. So what does it has as an implication? So I just want to study the implication of this and get ready for it. Like how can we get ready for it? And this urbanization process has its own merits and demerits so I just want to focus on the problems of this urbanization. Out of this for example we can see this is uh, 
a map, uh, a graph for hazards f that happened like for the past, starting from 1970. And <clears throat> out of these hazards, uh, like if we see like for the past 20 years, 40, some 45 percent of the hazards were uh, flooding events caused by flooding events. So that's why I'm interested in more of into flooding. And we have also experienced some things here last last two weeks in Seoul as well. Flooding was also a big deal here. And the objectives of this research are mentioned here. Uh, okay, the first one is to analyze the pattern and predict pre predict precipitation variability and to study the climate change. What impact does it have apart from uh, urbanization? Does climate change has any implication on it? Like for the increasing hazard, flooding hazard. And the second one is to quantify land use change and scenario based prediction until uh, 2030 and produce and analyze past, present and predicted flooding hazard uh, maps and analyze the role of urbanization and climate change for this. So these were the results so far. These are all physical results. So I took Addis Ababa as an example and I studied this, the development of the urban area for the past three decades and try to analyze the trends of the built up area and the urbanization trends. And as you can see, built up has uh, showed uh, uh, a very high increase uh, for the past three decades and the other environmental sensitive areas are like the area coverage is going down and also I also predicted that my prediction indicated that the future in the future until 2030 we are going to experience the same thing under two scenarios which are, which are the business as usual scenario and the restricted development uh, scenarios as well. So I have the physical aspect and also these are some graphs showing the change in uh, climate change and um, precipitation variability, rainfall variability. And from this I used uh, flooding maps to draw to study the flooding pattern of the city for the past three decades and predict for the future as well. So, so far I was focusing on the uh, physical aspect of the hazard. So. During this uh, research period, this fellowship, I just want to extend it to the social aspect and study the social aspect of uh, this hazard. So what is its implication and what type of social aspects does it have apart from the physical uh, problems that it is giving us now? And also how we can, uh, is it possible to design better flexible algorithms that can, that can predict for the future? It can be like predicting the urban development or the climate change variability, can we like apply those uh, machine learning algorithms in different cases, in different contexts? Because uh, we have like, for mostly in the developing uh, countries, we have similar, much of similar context. I cannot say that they're all completely similar, but they're like more or less the same. So can we like alter them a bit to tune them a bit to use them everywhere? Can we? make it like that. So that's my question as well for, these are the two big questions that I have for during the IRF and I, I, I want to answer these uh, questions uh, for uh, using my research and I hope uh, I'll get good uh, feedback from you guys as well and uh, I look forward to work with you guys as well. And please leave any comments or questions on the comment section of the YouTube and yeah, thank you very much. Chelsea Hello everyone. Um, I'm sorry first because I was, I thought that we could uh, take off our mask for the presentation, but as long as my nose is really big, it will keep falling down. So I will be still doing this, like doing the whole presentation. So please forget it and listen to me. <laughs> so yeah, I, my name is Charles, I'm from France. And um, 
I choose, I, I would like to start my presentation by um, showing you this picture I took last winter uh, before the coronavirus started, which shows um, a picture of Seoul with the Namsan Tower. And I really liked it because it shows both, both the contrast between um, the really quiet flow of the boats at the front, as you can see on the Hangang River, and like the really dizziness of all the buildings and the habitations you have behind. And also as well, like the bridge you have uh, along the river, which is really specific to, to a mega city like Seoul, I think, because I never saw that before. So yeah, I think I really like this image as well, because I think it uh, represents me in a certain way. Um, in that um, you can consider me as the driver of the boat of the picture because I consider myself as like someone who only does only whatever he wants. Like it means like if I don't want to do, them, to do something, I won't do it. Like a boat following um, the curse of the river and goes wherever he wants. Like, you know, when the river crosses, like thanks to arms, I choose where to go. So I think it's a good introduction for me to define, like to explain you how to define me as a, an activist researcher. Um, so this is my river, the, bo the river that my boat uh, follow, <laughs> follows. Um, first, I would like to say something about um, my country and the thing, like the way I, how I lived um, during my teenage years. I, I think it's similar with other countries as well, but in France, they, there is kind of a tradition of young people to follow the traditional path of school, then you have to go to university, then you do a master, then you have to find a job, then get a house, get a dog, get a wife or a husband, and then spend your life like this. And I think I was kind of, I hated it. So it's, I'm not saying like it's a bad thing, but I think it's kind of sad that it became a model of development, especially for young people, I think. I kind of suffer from that. So actually, I first, after I graduated um, high school, I followed the classic course of going to university in, I studied geography, it was really nice. It was, I had really beautiful memories from it. And yeah, as I said, I could approach the academic world for the first time in my life, which was really good experience, but then I broke it. And at that time in France, it was really not common for students, especially for bachelor students, to stop their studies like this after graduating. And, took, and I took a gap year. I traveled to Ireland and to Korea for the first time. And then I fell in love with the country, really, literally. And yet yeah, that trip, that gap year, was really for me an opportunity to find my own way to learn something. Not only English or travel, or like how to buy a plane ticket, but to learn by myself how the world around me was working and running. So that's how I took a break for the first time from general education and from the general path of uh, education. Then I came back after my gap year, I came back to Paris and I became a student again in my country. But I don't know if you experienced the life as a Parisian in France, but it's really nice, I really recommend it. But I didn't like it either, it was too much. So I decided to leave again to Korea to come back because I think this country, yeah, changed me, I think in a good way. So I changed this path again and I came back to Korea in 2000 and yeah, three years ago from today, really today. And I, I learned Korean because I really, I really had a lot of interest in the language and everything. So I learned the language and I decided to to go to university in that country as well. So I'm now studying, my board is now in Seoul, in Hangang, as you can see the, from the picture behind, and I'm studying transportation in Seoul National University. I have one year left. So yeah, I, I talk about boat and about transportation, which is my main interest nowadays. Um, I would like to come back to the past once again uh, because I think um, our research interest as activist researchers, I think all the interests we have, they come from childhood. And in my opinion, in my case, my childhood was really marked by a lack 
of mobility. I felt really frustrated by, because I couldn't go wherever I want, whenever I want, and however I want. Not because I was a child, but even when I was a teenager and a student, I was really frustrated because I'm from a small city in France, and I grew up the first 20 years of my life in a small city where only there is a shitty bus transportation system, really, I'm not afraid to say it, but the most efficient transportation mean is the car. And when you don't have a car or when you don't have uh, the permit, like the license, license, it's really frustrating because you're really limited in your travel and everything. So hopefully, um, like while growing up, I could experience uh, several um, means of transportation. As you can see, um, the tramway, the bus, the subway in Paris, which is really nice, really convenient. And as you can see in the top right of top right of the picture, the, the hell um, subway station of Seoul, which is really crowded, especially line two. Anyway, but the, I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying to share my experience. And um, yeah, so that's how, like from this frustration from my childhood, that's how I got interested in mobility issues and transportation issues. Um, but I'm not, going to only talk about transportation, but I think it's also important to talk about sustainability um, because, why is it important? Because um, it's important to all of us to build something which is uh, possible to keep in the future for the future generations as well. And also because it's trendy nowadays. Everybody is talking about sustainability and it's really, funny to see how everyone is talking about it, like the cities to promote their, um, their transportation system or anything and everything like to, it's, it's well, it's doing something good to do something sustainable. But one of the questions I would like to raise during the IRF is what is it? Like, is it, um, should we put everyone in buses, like deleted cars, deleted roads, like put pedestrian areas everywhere, or should we did it like throw up all the cars and like introduce electric cars, or should we reduce the speed in, in cities, in, in streets, or should we like, like a recent policy in Paris, or should we put everything that everyone needs inside uh, a 50 minutes walking area? I don't know, to be honest, I really don't know, and I'm not expecting to give the exact answer to that question, but I'm, I just would like to analyze and to present all those um, tools that have been undertaken by politics and cities um, to build that concept of sustainable transportation system. And as a conclusion, um, yeah, really, as I said, like my goal through the IR is to uh, raise awareness about um, really the central role that transportation is playing in our lives because transportation is not only roads and cars and subway, it's like the skeleton of the cities. Like inside, between the buildings, you have all the systems of roads and transportation and public transportation and bicycle and everything. It's like what builds the city. And I would let, and everyone is related to transportation in their lives. And I think everyone has transport troubles as it's seen in the picture. So I would like to show that um, transportation problems are more than just traffic congestion and the subway, uh, overcrowded subway. And I, yeah, I would like to finish my presentation by uh, thanking the IRF team to give me that kind of opportunity, really nice opportunity, opportunity to really freely talk like the boat, free, freely, like the, I think the freedom is really important uh, to talk about everything and debate about all these issues that um, young people are dealing with and will be dealing with um, in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you.
그리고 그 정책이 가진 임팩트에 관심이 깊은 펠로우인데요. 아야프를 통해 어떤 작업을 할 예정인지 들어보도록 하겠습니다. 하이 에브리원 These are the contents of my presentation today. I'll talk about who I am and my research topic. And I want to share my opinion on what activist research is and plan as an activist researcher. Uh, I'm Mina from South Korea. I'm the first year PhD student in urban studies. My field of study is economic development and I studied economics in my undergraduate school and studied public administration for my masters. And uh, I have work experiences in er international development field and worked at a research institution for science and technology policy. Uh, as a PhD student recently, I'm thinking about urban innovation from the institutional economics approach. And uh, this topic includes two questions, what is innovation and why urban? And about the first question, uh, the concept innovation in my research includes not only technological innovation, but also social innovation. I would like to use this integrated term of innovation uh, because historically, the original meaning of innovation was much more social, political, and cultural. But uh, in this modern society, only the technology innovation is likely to be highlighted. And academically, it is necessary to integrate matured technology innovation theories into new uh, social innovation field. And fundamentally, I think this integrated approach can provide a better explanation on better explanation of innovation in real world. Uh, first, uh, with this approach, we can see the demand side innovation and role of citizens as users. And second, uh, in this modern society where smart city projects are ubiquitous, uh, we need to ask question about who is left behind in this uh, economic development process through the introduction of technology and why. And I believe this integrated approach can provide a better or new explanation about this. And about the second question, I'm considering the locality of innovation. And I'm especially interested in urban area, uh, an area with a high population density. Uh, and many innovation theories uh, explains why innovation occurs in cities. And agglomeration economies is the representative theory. And it explains that companies and researchers uh, go to one area and form a city to take advantages for uh, matching resources and learning from each other and sharing the knowledge. And because of these externalities, uh, cities become larger and the function of innovation becomes stronger. And my question is, uh, how about the agglomeration economies in the integrated concept of innovation? Is the urban innovation, uh, urban area favorable for social innovation as well? And what are the characteristics of knowledge produced by the urban innovation? And how do people share that knowledge? And uh, to answer this question during the IRF, I want to study the living lab as a case of urban innovation. Uh, and uh, there is no universally accepted definition of living lab. And this definition is from Wikipedia. Uh, but in one sentence, I want to express living lab as a innovation with people, not innovation for people. And by looking into the living lab cases, I want to see the differences between urban living lab and rural one, and differences between supply side technology and demand side technology, and knowledge spillover in living lab. And about what is uh, activist research. Uh, from the time I applied for IRF, 
I kept thinking about what activist research is. And uh, personally, I think activist research is a duty producing for Nessus. Uh, for Nessus is a Greek concept, uh, variously translate as practical wisdom, practical judgment, or prudence. And uh, uh, a philosopher Aristotle regarded for Nessus as the most important one among the three intellectual virtues, epistem and techne, uh, and furnaces. But the curious fact uh, can be found, can be observed. Uh, that is, uh, we can easily find modern words for epistem and techne, like epistemology or technology, but it is really hard to find a modern word for furnaces. Uh, the fact indicates that uh, how much scientific and instrumental rationality dominates our modern thinking and knowledge. Uh, in this situation, I think AR can play a pivotal role in producing furnaces and following intelligence of the cities. And for me, uh, the area I want to make furnaces is uh, the monitoring and evaluation system. Uh, this is because I, I believe the change in the monitoring and evaluation system could lead to the change in the rules of the game. For example, we cannot force uh, CSV or CSR to large companies, but we can change their decision by co conducting some social value uh, evaluation. And for this change, I'll uh, keep thinking about what is invisible factors in the MNE process and how to evaluate some normative concepts like justice or fairness, which can be easily ignored in that process. And I believe as an uh, activist researcher in urban studies, I think uh, communicate with various communities will be the, important, the most important one. And as a researcher, I'll uh, think about what human is all the time and try to communicate with scholars through validate and reliable research. And as an activist, I will communicate with local communities to figure out missing values in the ME process and co communicate with policymakers to improve the po process. And perhaps uh, some people can um, argue that the biggest weakness of the AR could be the objectivity of that research. And regarding that issue, I agree with uh, Fully Berg's argument. He mentioned that uh, objectivity is not contemplation without interest, but implement employment of a variety of perspectives and effective interpretations in the service of knowledge. Uh, and this is why I apply for the IRF and what I expect uh, from the IRF program. I look forward to learning uh, various perspectives and interpretations from you guys here. And in that process, I hope I can find uh, my identity as a researcher. Uh, thank you for listening. <웃음> 네, 좋은 발표 감사드립니다. 어, 다음에 소개해드릴 펠로우는 윤호영 펠로우입니다. 이 펠로우는 덴마크에서 2년간 참여적 디자인 접근법을 연구하고 또 실험해 왔다고 하는데요. 미래 세대가 어떻게 도시 설계와 디자인 과정에 더 폭넓게 참여할 수 있을지 이를 통해서 다음 세대의 도시 권리가 어떻게 확장될 수 있을지를 연구한다고 합니다. 어, 큰 박수로 맞아주세요. 굿 아프터누. 마이 네임 이즈 호영윤. 앤 아이 앤 프레젠트 후 아이 앤 앤 왓 아이 앤 두잉. And what I will do during the second half period. I'm an industrial designer and social designer. When I introduce myself as a social designer, people usually ask me what is what social design is. So, what is a social design? 
Briefly and in my perspective, social design refers to solving social problems we are facing now and in the future um, with the design approach rather than regulation and laws. I'm going to show some example of social design project what I've done. When we face recycling issue, we or decision makers may suggest rules and penalties to resolve these problems. However, as a social designer, I could suggest so solutions based on the design approach to change people's mindset or behavior. It could be an event or performance like these pictures to raise citizens' awareness of the importance of recycling. Our team dressed up as aliens and we were finding recycled materials from the trash bin. We invaded um, Earth to take recycled materials because on our planet, all resources were exhausted and all recycled materials could be used as resources. In another case, for recycling issue in the social housing areas, it could be a um, uh, welcoming package for new immigrants to teach them how to recycle where recycling stations are and encourage community communication. These days, because of the physical distancing under the pandemic situation, isolation became a serious social issues. This kit is designed to help social interaction in the pandemic situation. The small objects in the kit are used to promote social interaction online. People who are under quarantine can use these kits to make something for the community competition or sharing. These are very small parts of social design. And as you can see, social design can suggest any forms of solutions to solve social problems, such as event performance, services, and product. So how could I become an activist researcher and designer? I've worked with diverse stakeholders across various fields, such as design, research, institution, NGOs, activists, and education in Denmark for the last two years. For this activist research, I mainly use the participatory design approach. It has been led by Scandinavian since the 1970s. And participatory design approach thinks users are partners, not subjects. So it engages people in the entire process by applying their opinion and ideas to the system. It is quite different from the approach of the user-centered design that designers typically use to design products for market profit. Tools for participatory design are really, really important because they can affect communication between stakeholders and it also affects people's participation. Through the participatory design approach, researchers can get unpredictable insight from the people. I'm researching and designing tools in order to properly engage diverse stakeholders in the process. This is so. How much do we engage the next generation in urban design? It is essential to engage the next generation in the urban design process because they are future owners. But how to engage them? My question starts from here, how? Here's my research question. How might we engage future owners in urban design to encourage their rights? And I believe the answer is the tools that can engage people in urban design process and citizen, engage citizens in urban design process. So during the second IR period, I'm gonna aim to research and design tools that can be used in Asian urban planning systems to engage stakeholders in the process 
actively. Thank you. <웃음> 네, 다음에 소개해드릴 펠로는 아시 다두알입니다. 여러분 혹시 쓰레기 처리에도 다양한 방식과 모델들이 있다는 것, 이, 이 점에 대해서 생각해 보신 적이 있나요? 국가마다 도시마다 쓰레기의 처리와 재활용 체계는 다르다고 하는데요. 아시는 이런 체계들을 비교하고 탐구하고자 하는 펠로우입니다. 발표를 들어보겠습니다. 굿 아프트눈 에브리바디. 땡큐 팀 IR for the introduction. Um, I'm really glad to be here today and um, I hope everybody here and the ones watching online, they're keeping safe and healthy. Very tough time. Um, my name is Arsh Dutval and I am from India. And let me start by giving you a glimpse of my educational and um, career background so far. Um, so in the year 2017, I graduated from the Central University uh, of India, which is in the capital, and I have lived most of my life in the capital, that is Delhi. Um, I earned a specialization in economics and English literature, post which I moved to a research internship with the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, and my first formal employment was in the year 2018 with the Global Entrepreneurship Network, um, where I worked to develop a startup ecosystem in my city. Uh, for the last one year, I've been living in South Korea, uh, pursuing my master's in public policy at KDI School, which is in the administrative city of uh, Sejong um, in the South. Um, I recently completed my coursework with a specialization in regional environmental and sustainable development. So uh, I have been an activist and I have been a researcher, but it wasn't until I was introduced uh, by Team IR uh, to the concept of being an activist researcher that I realized that uh, in a certain way, um, and uh, you know, all along, I have been an activist uh, researcher. So I would really like to thank Team IR for that reflection. Um, at the university level, I used art and performance um, by engaging with the theater community of the capital to dissent against a lot of social injustices that we have in the Indian society. Um, uh, and during the internship that I previously mentioned, I pursued the case of social inclusion for the marginalized communities who have been, uh, uh, for the last 70 years uh, post-independence, been excluded from the constitution and have been unable to get enough opportunity and uh, you know, civil rights. Um, even during my uh, professional engagement with the uh, international organization where we were developing the startup ecosystem in my country, I was particularly interested in social innovation. Um, and right now, I, my area of interest is urban design and urban development, and I think startups can play a very vital role in reshaping the cities and making them more resilient. So moving on to my interest at IR, um, I would pursue the case of waste management in India. Um, so India is a rapidly urbanizing uh, country and the economy is also uh, developing at a good enough and stable rate. Um, but the problem with the waste because of the pace of urbanization has been getting critical by the day. Um, out of uh, approximately 60 million tons of waste is produced in the, urbans, uh, uh, in the urban centers of the country, and uh, only one-sixth of the total waste ends up being treated or recycled. And uh, we are running out of landfills. Um, the, the ill effects are many. There are different kinds of uh, pollutions, water contamination, uh, excessive risk for health, especially for the areas which are closer to the waste management facilities, uh, which are often occupied by the marginalized communities. Um, and due to the lack of proper waste management system, I think India is missing out on a great economic 
uh, opportunity that the waste industry has and uh, you know, can be developed into. And it was actually during the pandemic that I started thinking about the whole waste management system in my country. Um, uh, a lot of news uh, surfaced uh, where uh, it was reported that the waste managers or the workers in the industry of waste management in India who particularly come from um, a certain caste uh, and ethnic groups, they were being uh, subjected to the danger of uh, managing the toxic waste, which is being generator, generated after the pandemic, the masks and the gloves, the PPEs, and they do not have any formal training. They do not have any insurance. Um, so it got me thinking and I realized that in the long run, uh, since the waste is now diversifying, um, India, uh, is, uh, uh, India is uh, facing a knowledge gap, which is increasing by the second, and uh, it would be harder to bridge it if we don't uh, start as soon uh, as possible. Um, so I started learning about waste management, and in a typical or a basic waste management cycle, there are five steps. The first is segregation, then the collection, then transportation, treatment, and disposal. So I started looking at the facilities and how the system or the uh, administration has been working back home. And turns out that the problem is the first step. So the whole cycle is disrupted because the first step uh, or the first part of the cycle, we do not have proper infrastructure, proper training, and uh, um, the waste is basically not being segregated. And hence, uh, only one sixth of it can be treated because it's been mixed to an extent that it becomes impossible to uh, segregate it after a certain point. Um, so what is the solution? Um, I identify myself as an advocate for citizen participation and engagement. And uh, I believe that the new form of governance where citizens have more accountability and uh, control can pave way for better systems, and in this case, a better waste management system. So, there, but for citizen participation, I also believe that there has to be a certain incentive um, to influence their uh, behavior towards uh, you know, a, certain, uh, a certain practice. Um, so, uh, as a part of my research with IR, I plan to follow um, and find the ways to influence this user behavior that you know has been um, has been uh, in my society for a while, where we do not segregate waste. And what are these incentives? Because India is a diverse society. Uh, we have different castes, we have different classes, we have different religions. And what is incentive for one is not incentive for another. So I have to look for various incentives in uh, various environments. Uh, in various communities, in various spaces. So I plan to do that as a part of my IR fellowship. And uh, I plan to also compile and assess the scope of different international models. Uh, for example, I looked at the waste uh, fee that uh, South, Korea, uh, South Korea relies on their citizens for you know, uh, having more uh, food waste or not recycling. And a very interesting model in Indonesia where um, you can actually trade trash for health insurance. So I'm looking at different kind of incentives right now. And beyond IARP, I also see myself um, um, transforming this research into an initiative, a project, uh, and continue to assess various, various forms of incentives and improve the overall cycle of waste management. So I'm starting at step one, but I uh, plan to uh, contribute to each and every level of waste management system and eventually have a better system for my country. So thank you so much for listening to me and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. And thank you team IRF once again. The Pegimur system 개선과 시민 참여 역할에 대한 아주 인상 깊은 발표였던 것 같습니다. 
다음에 소개해드릴 펠로우는 팀으로 참가한 펠로우입니다. 콜렉티브 딩굴팀인데요. 2012년을 시작으로 세월호 이후의 연극, 미투운동 이후의 공연예술 등을 고민해온 창작집단입니다. 최근에는 예술과 환경운동의 교집합에 대해 보다 고민하고 있다고 하는데요. 발표를 들어보겠습니다. Hello, we are collective d i n g u l around and d i n g u l is interactive art project group based on sensuous communication and making relations through coexistence. First, I will introduce each of the team members. I am Jisoo, who works as a, a director and producer. I am interested in observing and analyzing how social structures and the way people's daily lives interact. At school, I majored in anthropology and performing arts studies. As an artist and activist researcher, I think that I have to inform the public about the climate crisis with the artist performance. And at the same time, I want to accuse the reality of the destruction of the heritage of face-to-face -face artists cause of climate disaster. And Jong Eun is a performer and producer in j i n g u l Believing all human activities and relationships are reversed due to climate disaster, she is asking questions to change the relationship between art and society with the aim of proposing a new way of establishing communities in the era of climate crisis. She has been experimenting with the form of performance that creates social relationships and communities. In particular, she conducted an artistic research on how the social communities and the artist com art communities could interact after Me Too movement. And Jun Young is currently working as an independent curator. She always curated the exhibition with the question, what should art and exhibition do for people? However, recently, the question has been changed. What should art not do for people? When repeating the exhibition several times, she came to think that no matter how beneficial and good the message she wanted to deliver in the exhibition, the way the exhibition was produced should not be violent. In the process of creating an exhibition, a lot of garbage is created and she thought that this methodology needed a change. Now I'm going to talk about the team's works. And collective doing around is focusing on the work of talking about artistic Green New Deal and making concrete details now. Not long ago, d i n g e r declared to be an artist group responding to current climate crisis. So last year, we worked on a variety of topics, including the climate crisis, for example, um, the audience participation, virtual reality, reality exploration project opportunity series, delivers a message that there cannot be a new land anywhere when competition and survival remain the role of society without solidarity, even if we find new settlement for humanity by exploring and developing Mars, leaving the Earth to avoid climate disaster. While working on this project, we felt the limitation of dealing with the climate crisis issues only as a theme for our work. This is because we face a sense of crisis in which we need to speak loudly and continuously about the climate crisis in the art field and Korean society, as well as the necessity of a posi positive social transformation. We faced this, the pandemic and encountered the ontological concern of what art should be in this situation and in this society. Um, to be honest, we are on the verge of extinction because we've constructed the artistic language that we organize physicality and spatiality to create a place where the people can get together. 
But getting together has become a dangerous and literally harmful being in this pandemic situation. And no one thinks performances or exhibitions are essential to humans in the midst of the climate crisis. So we believe that we are artists, not as propaganda tools to announce the climate crisis, but as beings in solidarity with the extinct beings and those left behind. That's why we believe that the art, especially the face-to-face -face art, is worthwhile in this pandemic and climate crisis era. In addition, we are going to look at the point of how effective our methodology is in this climate crisis. This is because there is very little concern about the art creation process and subsequent waste issues. Um, and we would like to raise people's awareness about this problem and how to overcome these issues. Thank you for listening to us. <웃음> 네, 이번에 발표해 주실 펠로우는 박정우 펠로우입니다. 박정우 펠로우는 개인의 디지털 주권과 프라이버시 그리고 민주적 절차를 다루고자 합니다. 저는 최근 본 기사 중에 클리어뷰라는 기업이 전 세계 사람 얼굴 사진 약 30억 개를 수집해서 검색 가능하게 했다는 우려, 우려스러운 소식을 접했었는데요. 이와 같은 문제를 박정우 펠로우는 어떤 식으로 바라보고 있는지 궁금합니다. 발표를 들어보겠습니다. Hello everyone. My name is Jungwoo Park. This is me, or rather I should say this is my digital data double. Um, this picture will be more relevant once I start talking about my research project, but I thought it was a fitting introductory image rather than a picture of my face. But first, just a little bit of background about me. Here are four places that I've lived in. I'm a first generation Korean American immigrant. So starting from the top left going clockwise, I was born in Seoul. Then I immigrated to Southern California with my immediate family. And in the bottom right, that's Boston, near which I attended high school. And most recently, I've been attending college in New York City. Um, I've just completed my first year of undergraduate studies at Columbia University, and I'm planning to study economics. In terms of my experience as an activist researcher, on the research front, on the left, you see two pictures um, from a neural network-based object detection algorithm that I helped develop at UC Santa Barbara. And on the right, this past summer, I received a research grant from my university to study marketing strategies employed by Asian social media influencers. Now, on the activism side, most of it's been connected to my high school and college communities. This is a picture of a vigil for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence that I helped organize at my high school. And this is a rally organized by Housing Works, a nonprofit organization based in New York City that helps fight the joint crises of homelessness and AIDS that I've been involved in um, in the past year. Okay, now onto my actual research project for IRF. In the beginning, I showed you some of my location data. Well, I was inspired to go into my project, which revolves around the concept and the topic of personal data, the implication of widespread data collection, and possible ways of reimagining our relationship with and our understanding of personal data connection. I began interested, being interested in this concept at the end of last year, when the New York Times uh, published a series of reports on data from over 12 million smartphones from all across the US that they gathered. Um, this is just a small snippet of that data. It shows data from 10,000 smartphones that are tracked in Central Park. And this shows uh, how the New York Times was able to take one of those smartphones and track where that individual went all over New York City. So why should we care about this kind of data in the first place? Well, to begin with, data is perhaps the most economically valuable resource in this day and age. This is a photo from the company Ground Truth, which helps uh, develop targeted advertisements based on location data. So for example, if you were to walk past a McDonald's, you might then see an ad for McDonald's pop up on your social media feed. And really, the economic value of personal data is 
really mind-boggling. Last year, the company Pedara Minjok, or Pemin for short, which is a food delivery service in South Korea, was sold for 48 trillion Korean won, or about 40 billion US dollars. Now, this doesn't mean that the company delivered 48 trillion won worth of food, but rather it goes to show how valuable the personal data that they collect from their 10 million monthly users really is. Furthermore, personal data can be used to produce and train artificial intelligence-based software and programs. So on the left, you see a very simple neural network. And an example of this might be if you upload a picture of yourself and your friends on the beach to Facebook, Facebook might take that image and use it to develop and produce, let's say, face filter uh, software. Now, while these large tech companies that collect all of this personal data from us are, one of the are some of the largest and most influential companies in the world, we as consumers and regular people get to see very little of that economic profit. And the amount of information about ourselves that we have to give up to these companies is very, very valuable, which is why I want to explore the possibility of viewing personal data as a form of labor. That is a basic economic resource that is created by individuals and which is used to produce other economic products, goods, and services. And while this may seem kind of weird, because you know, it might seem silly to view watching YouTube videos or you know, liking your friend's uh, photos on Facebook to be a form of work, I think we, we as a society fail to value the importance um, and the personal quality of personal data. Because data doesn't grow on trees, it needs to come from actual living people, and these people need to put in their time, their energy, their attention um, to share their opinions and thoughts and preferences in order for this data to be produced in the first place. Now, there are many key obstacles to this kind of approach. The first is data itself. Data isn't a tangible object, nor is it a definite digital object in the sense that a song or a movie might be, so it's really difficult to apply intellectual property laws to it, for example. Also, some economists believe that the only way for people to actually reclaim control over their personal data is through the creation of what is known as data unions, similar to how labor unions are created for workers. Um, because in a legal technical sense, there's nothing really fishy going on because technically we consent to having our data be collected by these companies. And in, re in response to this, I might bring up, bring up a couple of points. First is that there is a huge gap in power between the companies and the consumers because a lot of these services that we rely on are essential to living in this current day and age. For example, I came to South Korea about two months ago and I really wouldn't have been able to function without relying on Kakao Map. And this becomes worse for platforms like Facebook or YouTube which have monopolistic control over their industries, right? For example, if you were you know, trying to buy a pen and you didn't like the quality or the price of one company's pens, you can just walk away and buy, you know, from another company. But that really isn't possible for something like Facebook because you not only use Facebook for the basic features that the company provides, but also for the other people that use Facebook. And there really is no alternative to something like Facebook or Instagram. Another problem is trying to place an economic value on data. Um, if we just try to distribute you know, the profits from one tech firm throughout the billions of users that, that rely on it over the uh, across the world, each person wouldn't really be getting much money. So I've been looking at some economists. One, some economists try to take an approach where they kind of tax companies proportionally proportionate to the size of the user base that they have. And one person compared it, compared it to how a building in Myeongdong is taxed higher because there are more people that go to it and thus it is a more kind of economically valuable building. And, and it really seems natural to tax such a building higher than a building in the countryside. So we might try to apply that kind of thinking to digital platforms. Another kind of more philosophical question might be if we try to place a, a price on data and privacy, it might end up disproportionately affecting uh, poor people in a more negative way. So for example, if, if we require companies to pay people for their data, right, it might 
you know, increase the economic barrier for poorer people to access or economically disadvantaged people to access really essential services in a digital society. And finally, I'd like to conclude on touching by touching upon the activist portion of this topic. So take targeted advertisements, for example. We might think that targeted advertisements are very convenient, but human beings really aren't like robots or computers. And it, and it really isn't possible to mathematically calculate the desires and the future choices of human beings. And we can kind of imagine how targeted advertisements might be limiting the amount of control that we have over our desires and our choices. And finally, to take a more recent example, we've seen many democratic uh, movements pop up all around the world. And we've also seen law enforcement agencies uh, purchase location data from various tech companies to try to track and arrest and quash some of these democratic movements. So I believe that raising awareness about how much widespread data collection is going on around the world and the dangerous implications that might have on our democratic establishments and values is also another really important aspect to keep in mind. Thank you. <웃음> 네, 이번에 소개해 드릴 펠로우는 필리핀에서 온 다이안 안젤린 플로레스 펠로우입니다. 아, 이 펠로우는 급속한 도시화가 이루어진 필리핀 마닐라에서 사람들에게 어떻게 지속 가능한 주거 환경을 보장할 수 있을지 고민을 해 왔는데요. 이번 아야프를 통해서는 그 범위를 좀더 아시아 도시들로 확장해서 사람들이 지속 가능하게 살아갈 수 있는 주거지 개발 방법과 모델을 탐구한다고 합니다. 큰 박수로 맞아 주세요. Hello everyone. Uh... Hi, so let me try to introduce myself first. I'm Diane Angeline Flores from the Philippines. And let me start by presenting you my activist research proposal for IR. So I divided my presentation into three roles as a civil engineer and my journey to become an urban planner. And finally, as an activist researcher. So as a civil engineer, I had my bachelor's degree in the University of Santo Tomas in the Philippines, and I specialized on construction management. And I'm actually a licensed civil engineer, a real estate broker, and a master plumber in the Philippines. And for the past five years, my career path was as a civil engineer, I focused on high rise and low rise residential development. And currently, um, I'm a master's student here in South Korea in the University of Seoul. I'm studying about urban planning and design. And I'm also a research assistant in the Temporal Spatial Analysis Lab in the University of Seoul. So as an urban planner, um, my research focus is actually on issues on developing countries that are related on struggling and underprivileged Filipinos or like citizens, I wanted to seek solutions for rapid urbanization, urban poverty, and housing backlogs. So I want to characterize by uh, characterize characterize and assessing suitable sites for in-city resettlement and development for low-income people and for the capital region of the Philippines, which is Metro Manila. So one of the most pressing issues in the Philippines construction sector is actually the chronic housing shortage. So as per statistics, the housing gap from 2017 to 2022 is about 6.5 million. And if it's not addressed, it could actually rise up to 22 million in two decades. So I asked myself, like, how do you close the housing gap? How do you resolve the housing backlog? So the government, they said like, the, gover the government thinks that if we build, we build more houses, we can actually close the housing gap. And they said that increasing the number of houses, which not only address the housing gap, but also boost the economy. So this kind of economic trigger is something that the, con the country actually needs at this time. Because 
at the time when the economy is reeling from the impact of COVID-19 crisis, they, the concept of the government thinks that if we build more houses, this will, this will actually boost the ac activities in the supply chain and it will trigger more economic activities, more supplies, uh, more resources for the government and more resources for the people. But I think a main factor that the government actually lacks is considering the social context in the equation. The reason of the housing backlog is not actually the insufficiency of the housing. It's actually this current private partnership market, this current private public partnership of a marketi marketized socialized housing program that actually produces unoccupied housing. Housing that are located in re remote and low valued sites with substandard construction and livelihood constraints and inaccessible transportation and lack of security and actually they are located in naturally hazard locations because Philippines is actually an archipelago. We are very prone to natural hazards such as earthquake landslides. So resolving this urban housing problem is actually Metro Manila's grave, cha grave challenge of a foundation for an inclusive growth and a high trust society. So I believe all sectors of society, whether it's public or private, should direct their efforts toward creating opportunities for everyone to enjoy a stable, a convenient and secure life. So the government in particular must use its tools of fiscal, monetary, and regulatory policies to steer the development path towards enabling Filipinos or everyone in the world to attain their ambition under their, um, their dream and actually to have the specific one goal. So as an activist researcher, I believe these two main factors, um, balancing growth, balancing growth and development opportunities and enhancing the social fabric can actually uplift or uplift the lives of Filipinos in the Philippines. So providing a home for underprivileged people will uplift not just them, but everyone else in the city. So like the humanities Robert Ingersoll said, we actually rise by lifting others. So the first factors of balancing growth and development opportunities, I believe that we have to develop the in infrastructure to support growth, improve access, reduce the vulnerability, and improve human development outcomes. We have to maintain an ecological integrity, healthy environment, and addressing solutions to climate change. We have to expand and increase access to economic opportunities. We have to reduce the vulnerability of the poor. And lastly, we have to accelerate human capital development. We have to primarily in health, nutrition, and education. The second factor is enhancing the social fabric. So by promoting peace, public, promote peace, public order, and ensure security, we have to build trust in the public institution. And lastly, we have to promote and value the cultural diversity through awareness, sensitivity, and embracing a shared heritage. So with this um, formula or equation and considering a variety of factors, we can actually resolve the housing backlog and most importantly, um, the greater welfare of the society. So for this IRF, um, my proposal is I want to develop this model that actually um, assess suitable sites for in-city resettlement developments that considers a variety of criteria, not only technical, but also we have to consider the natural, physical, social, economic, and environmental impacts. And lastly, I think um, if we get to develop this type of decision making, it can posit positively influence and help urban planners and local decision makers in bettering the metro area's urban landscape and consequently lower its urban poverty because this will actually ultimately uplift the living conditions of underprivileged citizens and by, by simply providing one of the most basic needs, which is shelter. So here actually ends my presentation and thank you for everyone for listening and maraming salamat po.
네, 어, 이제 절반 정도의 펠로우들께서 발표를 마치셨는데요. 다음 펠로우는 영국에서 온 루크 라이드아웃입니다. 루크는 다양한 분야에서 활동하고 있는 크리에이터인데요. 루크의 포트폴리오를 보시면 디자이너로서의 탁월한 능력은 금방 알수 있겠더라고요. 근데 그가 어떻게 디자인과 사회적 문제를 연결시키는가에 대해서도 매우 흥미로울 것 같아요. 룩의 발표를 들어보시죠. 헬로 여러분. 오, 잠시만요. 제가 조절했어요. 그래서, 예, 저는 룩. 제가 설명드릴 수 있는 것들을 제가 해본 프로젝트에 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 설명드릴 수 있는 것들을 제가 해본 So I have a background in graphic design, uh, working on projects from uh, web to exhibition. But after some years of this, I felt it wasn't going to be a fulfilling uh, career path. So I wanted to uh, explore more community-focused and social design. I graduated my bachelor's course with this portable radio studio, which uh, was an attempt to support and document the community interactions within my university. Uh, after that, I went on to study an MA in the design of experiences in Amsterdam, which involved using creative methodolo methodologies to investigate and reveal the power structures that drive institutions. So in this example, uh, I collaborated with the FNV, a trade union in the Netherlands, to develop a, an operatic rendition of their struggle against platform economy companies, whose controversial approach to workers' rights was uh, affecting the emergence of a social class known as the pr precariat, which is kind of a combination of proletariat and precarious. Um, It's me doing some activist research. Uh, my graduation project for my MA was called uh, Supply Chain Broadcast. And during that, um, I wanted to investigate with my partner the dispersed institution that is the coffee supply chain. So starting at a rural farm in Kenya, we traveled following the beans back towards uh, a cafe in Amsterdam uh, interviewing and gathering perspectives of the people we met and then sharing them amongst each other to uh, increase their awareness of each other because things like supply chains are so essential today but the people involved in them don't really have agency over the, the whole system. So that was the aim with that. Uh, the outcomes were primarily an audio-visual series but also set of... Uh, designed objects, and some speculative writing about potential futures for the supply chain for coffee and also supply chains in general. Uh, since coming to Korea, my partner and I set up uh, Space Bakers to do more socially focused work. So for example, we've worked uh, running, a, this is a workshop in an elementary school where we brought some local university students together with the elementary students to think about uh, how to fix the street. So getting them interested in urban design and method, methodologies for taking agency over their, their own city and space. Uh, and then this is an installation in a disused bathhouse in a rural town, which was an attempt to sort of reinvigorate this place, which is experiencing population decline. So running workshops with local people and involving them in creating some sort of new narrative about, about their space. Mm, currently, I'm working at Zero One, which is an open innovation platform, which is trying to mix together art, technology, and business to come up with new approaches to solve the contemporary problems. So moving on to my IARF project. My research focus is going to be on local circular infrastructure and gauging like, feasibility for making this success successful. So I define that as reusing, define it roughly, as reusing waste generated within a local area to create new products and services for residents. Um, 
I, I think this is a powerful way to promote conscious decision making uh, as the economic and environmental benefits can be felt directly in the community. There are already in Seoul some good examples of this sort of thinking. So this is uh, Seoul Upcycling Plaza. Uh, they have already a system where they, uh, waste comes in, it's sorted, cleaned, um, and then businesses within the Upcycling Plaza can use it to create new products and services. And there's also the Upcycling Lawn in the Innovation Park here, another good example. Oh. Combined with the context of the Green New Deal, uh, I think it's a really perfect time to be working on this sort of project, especially in Seoul and in Korea. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm interested in how these ideas can really be integrated into the daily life of a neighborhood. So uh, on a s small scale, local level. Uh, for example, through augmenting the existing recycling centers, which each uh, area has. Yeah, how can these ideas be integrated into the daily life of a neighborhood is my sort of focus and question. So that the key aim is building knowledge of and support for local circular economy infrastructures. Uh, these, these are just some images of my research so far, various references. Uh, strategies I'd like to use are mapping the challenges and opportunities for this sort of infrastructure and involving residents and businesses in prototyping ways to close uh, or create rather resource loops so things aren't going to landfill. Uh, and imagining how policy and business models can address the complexities of the situation. So here, some examples uh, here on the left is Soul Rebels, which is an Ethiopian company who uh, use waste materials to create shoes uh, and other clothing products. It's a social enterprise. And then in London, you have companies like Cracked It, which um, they collect broken technology, phones, laptops, things like that, uh, and teach ex-offenders, especially young people, uh, the, the skills they need to repair them giving them economic uh, opportunities that they wouldn't usually have or would be difficult to access. Uh, the sort of impact I think this could have is that by creating local infrastructure, communities can become more invested in ecological movements in general, uh, and it can build a uh, resilient local economy. And that by building a compelling system, people will naturally participate rather than needing to be persuaded to participate. Thank you. <웃음> 네, 이번에 소개해 드릴 펠로우는 우즈베키스탄에서 온 쇼크루크 아바조브 펠로우입니다. 전자 정보와 시민의 디지털 참여에 관심을 가지고 있다고 하는데요. 특히 여성의 인식과 여성의 참여 확대 방안에 대해서 연구를 한다고 합니다. 그래서 궁극적으로 디지털 어, 참여에서 성평등한 서비스를 어떻게 구축할 수 있을지를 탐구하고 있다고 합니다. 그럼 쇼크루크의 발표를 들어보시겠습니다. So hello everyone. Uh, hello to uh, to the world who is listening our presentation from the uh, online. Uh, so and hello my team IR fellows. So uh, I'm Shohru from Uzbekistan. Uh, uh, let me introduce my um, research idea and research uh, uh, project uh, in, in the framework of uh, IR fellowship. So uh, I'm, as I told you, I'm from Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is one of the ancient uh, cities in the uh, Central Asia, uh, which was the center for the Silk Road. So uh, this is uh, two uh, big cities, photos of the two big cities. Uh, and then uh, uh, let me introduce myself. So uh, uh, I, I recently gra graduated the Yonsei University Public Administration Department uh, in, in the PhD program. So I was a grantee of the Brain Korea 21 uh, scholarship program under, under the National 
uh, Research Foundation um, of the Korea. Uh, so uh, I was a team member of the research team member of the International Development and Social Economy uh, re Research Project team. And my uh, uh, my research uh, interests include uh, digital transformation and then uh, ICT for development. So uh, before that, uh, before joining Yonsei, I was I also studied in the KDI School of Public Policy and Management. Uh, in 2015, I graduated, and then uh, before that, uh, my master, uh, my bachelor degree was in, at National University of Uzbekistan. I did BA in law. Uh, so, in terms of uh, the work experience, uh, I, I lastly uh, I was involved in the as a research assistant at Yonsei University, and then uh, I was a, a specialist, uh, we can say consultant in the e-government development center. is a think tank for of Uzbekistan, which deals with the digital transformation uh, in the in Uzbekistan. So uh, before that, I was also lawyer, uh, and I, I was uh, uh, strengthening my. Uh, uh, work experience in the law. Also, uh, uh, I, I, I was an intern in the NGO, Iskbali which, Aulot, uh, which gave me a very interesting uh, experience uh, as a young uh, graduate. Uh, so, uh, let me tell you uh, my research background because my uh, IR research is uh, related to the, uh, my re recent research background and my work experience as well. Uh, this is my research interest uh, list. So, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, I'm really interested in uh, uh, digital government and, and public service innovation, how we can the leverage the ICT uh, in the digital uh, digitalization of the society. Uh, so, uh, recently, my, my dissertation results uh, show, showed that uh, the 79% the, the of the users were mostly uh, 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 mostly uh, male, while uh, f female were only 21%, because my uh, research dissertation was related to the adoption of the uh, online services, public services in Uzbekistan. And then um, my study has found that almost 60% of the e-services e uh, were uh, the, used by young people. So, uh, and I, I saw also, I look at to the uh, e-participation portals uh, because uh, I, I, the e-participation e is a, a kind of new innovative uh, platform for my country, for, uh, for young people, for other uh, citizens who, who can engage in the decision-making process. So I, I saw that, I, I saw that, uh, and I, as I'm living in Korea, I check it, um, uh, I checked uh, Korean uh, e-participation and uh, statistics. So I found out that uh, also uh, mostly in Korea, also females are use, uh, sorry, uh, males are users of the e-petition e, uh, e, e portal because uh, as you can see in the slide here also, uh, uh, here, yeah, you can see here, uh, so, uh, and then uh, he, here you can see that uh, male petitions are more uh, in terms of uh, in comparing to female e-petitions. Uh, so uh, when I was applying for IR, I, uh, I saw that uh, comparing Uzbekistan and Korea would be a nice uh, research project because uh, in, ter in terms of uh, digitalization, Korea is far, be far uh, ahead of Uzbekistan and then um, uh, also, at the int according to internet statistics uh, here, uh, Korea in, in internet in terms of internet users by gender, the uh, Korea is there is almost no gap, and in, and also you can see Kazakhstan is a re uh, regional neighbor of Uzbekistan. Also, there is very tiny gender gap, but but Uzbekistan has a little bit a huge gap in terms of male and female internet users, but, but the thing is um, the, uh, the quantification of the, uh, this kind of uh, research brings uh, uh, not, um, uh, not deep results. So I decided to, uh, <coughs> to, to, see, uh, uh, to see the young woman's perception on digital government services particularly how they, uh, part, uh, how they think that 
digital participation and uh, in political decision making process uh, how they find out find themselves in this in this uh, process in these innovative platforms and uh, and to understand I would like to understand why uh, uh, they are less politically involved because the data see, says like that and uh, that data dem demonstrated this uh, and also uh, I mean, descriptive data pre, uh, and preliminary data show that. And also, I would like to determine what kind of uh, uh, factors we need to focus in developing, uh, building gender responsive uh, digital uh, participation services or policies. Uh, uh, so uh, to, do, to achieve my goal uh, in this IRF program, uh, I would like to um, rely on the digital gender divide theory and then the global uh, digital inclusion framework, because uh, this is the issue of the digital inclusion, uh, the, because I believe that all digital uh, services, digital government should um, cover, include all uh, vulnerable groups, all, all citizens. Uh, so and I would like to conduct qualitative interviews uh, with, uh, with, suited, uh, uh, with uh, uh, <coughs> Korean and Uzbek women. Uh, so and compare their perception and uh, find out the, the, the different results. Uh, what, what factors influence in Korean society? What factors in influence in Uzbek society? Uh, and then I would like to use preferred sample, sampling. And uh, um, uh, so this is uh, basically introduction of my research. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, li please leave comment. I will. I will. I will. I will uh, discuss. We will discuss about this. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Ne,以及张云석飞罗的所给的了，我看见的哟。张云张云석飞罗，呃，呃，IAPOM的页面，生态学校，一个单词，登场。呃，生态学校，一个词，我们，我们，我们，我们，我们，我们，我们，我们，
I have uh, the climate depression some miles and also live together now. And this is the common scale in January when Australia is burning. It's a memorized life dying ceremony. I speak about the mind we face on this, this unpredictable crisis. And climate crisis including COVID-19. And the connected question is that where we go, why I born in this area and why I exist, this facing the extinction, the, this is a hard question also can, cannot avoid. Then if avoid the discussion and the seven years you already left to tipping point, you can be confronted with reality and less active. And please the starting the video. So my recent days, how can I explain it is kind of the extinction rebel rebellion. And this is the forum discuss about LDS long-term low green gas emission development strategies. And we have to submit until this year in the emission plan that how must we reduce emission gas until the 2050. But unfortunately, this expert group does not include a natural plan. And we don't have the opportunity to re require our message. So the last selection is to steer experts mic and we ask them what is the justice, what is the crime is justice and don't break down our future. And also I introduced this is the, the Youth Climate Emergency Action Group that I joined and active and we declare our voice right that we don't have time to survive and this is not a green new deal, just a gray new deal to the uh, New Deal version of Korea. Additionally, a uh, brief uh, promote the your door is always open and coming together. And it's also good for opportunity to join us and please DM to me. And it's my background experience on the university. I focus the student movie, well, student movement, fight to school authority for protecting our education right and also guard the printing room and stationary room register the Marquez rule. It's a kind of gentrification, I think. And also make uh, the green movement in university. We declare the climate crisis emergency declaration first on the university in Korea. Uh, name of the, the spring ever returned to this roast field. And then is my the Korean fellows activist. I can active because they exist beside on me. And also, it, the, I risk each the time to introduce my research. I'm majoring in social sciences of university and study with ecological economics and environmental sociology, development study, and Korean philosophy. And this year, I focused on environment justice and climate justice, uh, and plus the Green New Deal. Also, degrowth of Georgism or social or circular economy and climate depression, class finance is also primary topic to me. And I study in Odunara is the kind of the study with the Korean philosophy and the ecology, ecosophia lab, the ecological wisdom lab I research on there. And oh, a shame, but this is a thinker who I respect ever. As you know, uh, Ivan Elitsi, who philosopher and ecologist, and Kim Sangbong is the Korean philosopher, I, my professor, and Karl Polanyi, Harry Joji, Karl Marx, who, who critiqued the capitalism very radically, I think. And I, uh, uh, because someday I want to be a scholar who active and research. And I want to see all phenomena or social problem crisis by this, their point of view. And also the connection of my research in topic on IAF, I will theorize that can explain the holistic uh, problem about the tragedy we face on. 
is the IF research proposal, the global eco side of Korean companies. And what's eco side means is the ecological disruption and human disruption and uh, killing so, so many people and nature is dying about that. And, and it is the uh, exploitation in Asia and focused on the Korea enterprise, the chemical extent or overseas power plant investment and land exploitation of the palm oil. And key question is why are Korean companies notorious as villain, especially in the disruption in the global ecocide, global ecosystem? And what is the, the structural cause of them? The Korean company are making the Asia as hell now. I'm so sad and angry about that. And I introduced the first case, uh, Corindo and Posco International and Samsung's uh, illegal and exploitation of Indonesia Papua. They they steal the people's land and uh, burn and keep the the palm oil tree. And it is the very many emission gases going, and uh, this is cause of the climate crisis. And so many people and nature is. The cured it, and I research here on that, and I inform the that case. I go, and it is also the second case, uh, overseas power, power plant the investment and structure, and Capco and Tucson and Samsung oversee the that investment, and now we are. Uh, president and your governors to say the Green New Deal, but they invest in the Indonesia and Philippines and Malaysia to oversee power plant. It is the very seriously uh, bad thing. Oh, we already a second I have. And the last case is the LG Camps to India because of Patanam gas disaster. And based on this case, I try to suddenly the Edge Chem is the, the kind of green user company in Korea, but they killed so many people and the uh, ecosystem. And I tried to make a theoretical solution, a theory that can analyze this the, or accident to the critically. At the same, same time, I'm going to research and make it public uh, with you and active together. And I must inform this because this is why I apply in IAF. And everyone who used to buy that uh, the terrible the corporations of material, you, have, uh, you should know about uh, this truth, I think. It's time to say goodbye. And what I mentioned, we gain hope when we realize that we look at the same star and, and direction. Thank you to, thanks to gave hope to me and I saw they, thank you for hearing. <웃음> 네, 인상 깊은 발표 감사합니다. 다음에 소개해드릴 펠로우는 황준서 펠로우입니다. 황준서 펠로우는 환경, 평화, 안보의 교차 관계에 관심을 가지고 탈인류세 시대 한국의 생태 평화 운동의 지평을 연구하는 리서처입니다. 이번 아야프를 통해서는 한국의 환경 그리고 평화 활동가들의 교차 활동에 대해서 보다 심도 있게 탐구한다고 하는데요. 발표를 들어보시겠습니다. 아, 아. Hello, my name is Junseo Huang. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank for the um, IF team for hosting this event. And there is a staff, especially, who is producing uh, Korean subtitles while I'm talking. So I'm going to deliver this presentation quite slowly, a wee bit slowly, to provide uh, precise Korean subtitles. So uh, as an environment activist and a peace researcher, as well as criminologist, I chose my research topic during this IF program as uh, to collect Korean voices of the Green Peace Transition, uh, which is preparing for the post Anthropocene in South Korea um, as well as Asia. I've got some pictures in my presentation um, which kind of optimize my ration, uh, the rationality of my research. So, 
basically you can see there's a picture, uh, bit, uh, picture of two leaders in the Korean Peninsula and they're having a very nice smile with a, um, with a talk. And I'm asking, I'm questioning myself whether which peace are they making uh, while you see there are deforestation and the construction of a mili construction of military bases and also climate crisis and um, animal domination of animals in the country uh, noting that the i'd like to note especially note that the illegal bear bile industry has lasted in south korea for three three decades um, so my ideal uh, during this during this program um, by doing a research is to deliver a message or an, enlarge a message that we need a green peace transition, not just green, either either green, green transition or peacemaking uh, in South Korea in the post anthropocene So how I got this research question or how I uh, reached it to design this kind of research is that first I'm an act environment activist. So as an, as an activist, I like the quote, I'd like, which I'd, I'm going to read now. Uh, never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, unnecessary trouble. This was spoken by a civil rights leader, John Lewis. And I like the quote because I am not that talkative uh, in my everyday life, I think. But I'd like to make some lots of noises uh, in streets and conferences and out uh, public spaces where I have to, where I think I have to. So I have covered lots of uh, activist, activist environmental issues, uh, ranging from the Four Grand Project uh, done by our lovely president, Myung Bak Lee, and also uh, the Olympics, uh, the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, um, and also military, but my, my central focus was on military impact on the nature, on, on nature and, and on, the, on the environment. So I went to Okinawa, Japan, to deal with uh, environmental destruction in Okinawa uh, caused by military uh, base, uh, the construction of or, or the enlargement of military base, especially US military base. And also, you may have heard of a very grand project coming up in Seoul, the, around Yongsan, uh, which, will, which will commence after the return of the Yongsan mil US military base. Uh, but actually, you may also know the host, the movie host uh, in Korean, Kwemul, uh, which was based on a real story of the US military base that disposed of formaldehyde illegally, uh, but without no prosecution or no illegal, uh, no legal uh, justice delivered uh, by, the Korean, by the Korean government. So I have focused on military impact, on US militaries, also national militaries, uh, so military impact on the environment and also the planet. Why uh, laws, why environmental law is simply not enforced to military. Uh, and just realized uh, military officials, they always like to use this kind of, uh, this kind of narrative that, oh, this is, uh, this is necessary, you know, military impact on the environment. Is, we know that, but this is in necessary in the, under the name of national security. So that point was kind of uh, my way to at that point was the beginning point of my path to be a researcher. Um, and as a, peace, as a peace researcher, I also have, so my, I have focused on military impact on the nature, uh, on nature basically. So uh, remnant of war and also how we can manage the DMZ, the DMZ in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but also while I was doing, uh, dealing with this uh, concept of security, I kind of expanded my uh, uh, scope of research to security justice and also uh, peace. So now I am a kind of a criminologist as a doctoral student in criminology and environmental politics. I'm dealing with environment governance of uh, environment governance that prevents environment crime and uh, organized crime and also terrorist groups uh, which commit environmental crime uh, to gain some profits to maintain their works activities. So I'm actually based in, now I'm in South Korea, but I'm actually based in Belfast, Northern Ireland, um, one of the post-conflict societies in the world. And, and now I'm dealing with um, organized environmental crime allegedly committed by the Irish Republican Army uh, and how we can rebuild a, a environmental governance by, uh, by promoting peace, peaceful relationships between divided communities and uh, also, how we can resolve division between human and also non-human beings to, re to rebuild environmental governance in the post-Anthropocene. 
and how we can enlarge, how we can extend the concept of environmental justice to uh, ecological justice or green justice, whatever you want to call, but basically extend, extend human-oriented concepts of justice, law, and other uh, political concepts from uh, ecology, ecocentric perspective will be, uh, has, have been my work, research work. So, um, all in all, uh, I, oh, sorry, I just realized I didn't mention my research title during the IF, but I cannot go back, I, I guess I cannot go back, but, so the research title of my IF project will be Connecting the Dots uh, by Collecting Korean Voices for the Greenpeace Transition in the post anthropocene So, the essence of the, ty essence of the research will be how I can connect the dots, how I can connect uh, existing voices for environmentalism and peace, move, peace activism uh, together to draw a holistic picture, to, to, uh, to draw a larger picture for a green peace transition or peace transitions uh, in the post-Anthropocene. Uh, speaking of the post-Anthropocene, I am understanding Anthropocene as, a, as kind of the last stage of the human civilization which, would, which should come to an end uh, by facing a mass extinction of species, including human itself. So, the research question of this project will be how and to what extent environmental and peace activists in South Korea uh, have pursued intersecting activities and how that can contribute to post-anthropocentric post peace transition in the Korean Peninsula. Sorry, sorry for being a bit long, a wee bit long. So, uh, to divide into two, two sub-questions, I'm going to meet, probably by online, uh, and collect voices of uh, environmental and peace activists, actually, who will be actually my colleagues uh, in the field and how they have uh, managed to work together or how they have thought about uh, future projects on uh, dealing with peace issues from environmentalist side and also how peace activists have dealt with environmental issues from their own side. And I'm going to see what kind of, uh, what kind of bridges we can build together and, and also how that can, how, what will be the direction, the uh, overall direction of those voices. Uh, that will be my project. So probably I will, I will meet animal rights activists also activists uh, who, is, who are working on the DMZ conservation, uh, probably also um, environmental refugee issues. I'm going to deal with some, uh, some aspects of environmental refugee issues and uh, also the Green Party perhaps. And also there are some activists who are, make, who are trying to make a party for animals, kind of animal liberation party. Uh, so those will be my targeting uh, target interviewees. And so, I, uh, as a last message, I like this picture. So don't panic and organize. Uh, this is kind of my way and uh, a way of my understanding that represents uh, what activist uh, research is. So basically, you make a noise, but by scientific research, which uh, which aim to change the world, not interpret, not just interpret the world. So based on scientific research, we organize ourselves for better activism so that we, can, we, are, not we are not being chased by uh, the powerful, but we become powerful to change the world. Thank you. The world of 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 the 큰왕 펠로우는 기자 생활을 바탕으로 미디어가 성소수자 이슈를 제대로 전달하고 있는지 또 우리 사회의 다양한 소수자들이 왜곡 없이 목소리를 내기 위해서 미디어는 어떻게 기능해야 하는지 살펴보고자 합니다. 박수로 맞이해 주시기 바랍니다. สวัสดีครับ Thank you. That's uh, the Thai equivalent of 안녕하세요. So, <laughs> hello everyone, I'm Sipashai uh, Kunuwong, or as you call me Zoom, my nickname, just call me Zoom for easy. Um, I'm from Thailand, I'm 30 years old, 
I'm queer and I'm here. I like it. <laughs> anyway, so um, glad to meet you all today. I mean, we've been meeting for two days, but glad to um, just have this session with you guys. Um, so first of all, I'd like to tell you about my journey, um, my process as a human. Um, I'm from Thailand, as I said, and then one aspect of myself that really shaped um, who I am today is, um, is journalism. So I started my career in journalism um, eight years ago, and um, it's really broadened my view um, as a person. Um, in 2013, I joined Thai PBS, which is the Thai public broadcasting service, uh, doing a documentary about cultures and ethnic minorities in uh, Southeast Asia. So I met a lot of people, I talked to a lot of people, and this experience really broadened my, um, the aspect, the social aspect and historical aspect of a society. So I got to understand um, the society in Southeast Asia through historical and uh, cultural lens. After that, I joined um, the BBC, Thai language, which is the, 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 the Thai service for the BBC uh, World News, and uh, AFP, which is the, um, one of the biggest um, international news agency. I covered many news beat from politics to social issues to economics to breaking news. And during this time, I gained a lot of uh, knowledge on the political and um, political social aspects of the society. And I cover not only Thailand, but other countries um, nearby as well. And during this time, I also did some freelancing works with um, local and regional media voice online and uh, SCMP, which is the, um, the media in Hong Kong. So I produce um, digital videos for them. I interviewed uh, people, I edit myself, and I make this kind of short form. I'm not sure if you, you guys are familiar with, you know, like five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, short videos and post it on YouTube or um, Facebook. Yeah, so I did this. And as you can see, that one is about um, environment activists in Thailand. It's garnered 100,000 uh, 100, likes and 5 million views. So I kind of uh, practice this kind of skill, you know, this uh, short form digital storytelling. Um, this experience has kind of questioned me, what can journalists or media personalities do more to push for the social change and democratization in my country. So that's why I enrolled in the, this program in Song Kong Wei University. It's called Interasia NGO Studies. So we study about human rights, uh, democracy, uh, peace, and um, uh, political change and stuff like that. But my focus for my thesis is on digital media, the protests, you know, the hashtag activism, how they influence each other. Um, in this program, it's also made me realize the limitations of the media. Uh, so, um, in usually, usually when the media presents story, we reporters, journalists, we go, we choose. Um, subjects, sources that we want to present, right? We choose from their character, from their experience, for, from their expertise, from their needs, from their hope. We want to tell the story of this person or a group of person, and then we create our content. We write story, we make uh, radio works, uh, we make podcasts, something like that, and we publish on our platform. And then these content, um, the public can get our content from the, the media, right? But in doing so, we actually are 
there, there are limitations as well. You know, we work in company. It's a capital, uh, capitalistic culture. You know, we are governed by social pressure, uh, social pressure, economic interests of the company, uh, political tensions as well. You know, if you live in a not so free society like in Thailand. So um, this has got me thinking, you know, these limitations that we have, how can we uh, do more? So um, as also myself, I've been practicing uh, digital storytelling. So I felt that um, there's a way that actually people can really tell the story uh, by themselves. They can, you know, use digital storytelling to produce some works and then publish on digital platform, either website or, you know, social media is so easy these days. It can be videos, photos, illustrations, podcasts. So people can do it by themselves. Um, so it's now, this is what I want to do during the IAF is the, um, I want to create, I want to experiment with this um, that dimension uh, uh, model that people can voice themselves. So I want to focus on the LGBTQ uh, community in Korea because I know that they face a lot of discrimination and um, there's so many problems that they, they, they have to endure. Um, and also I've made some few visits to some places, you know, the um, LGBT friendly church service and uh, this uh, billboard that was got destroyed uh, because it promotes um, LGBT, um, yeah. And so I want to focus this group and this is what I come up with. So I have two stage in my research. The number one is that how can the community, the marginalized community like the LGBTQ in Korea do to really unpack their lived experience, you know, their needs and hope, their dreams. So I propose that um, I would like to try with participatory methods and I call it is uh, two stage. It's called recalling their lived experience, their struggle and revisioning about their future, what they want the society to know about them. So, but my question is how? Number two is that how they can tell their story. So I propose to use digital storytelling and I call this process reclaiming identity. So um, the question also how? So it's either I collaborate, collaborate with them or some in um, some other form. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find out during the IEF program. And the last question is, um, with this too, you see that we, I want to create this kind of community, the offline community where the LGBT community come together, create a safe and uh, free space for them to uh, also uh, retell their story and create community. And also I want to create an online uh, platform where they can reclaim their history and identity. And I want this to be a community kind of platform. So this is uh, the question. Um, um, so the first one, I just want to uh, say it again. So the first one is what are the suitable methods for the research participants to recall their lived experiences and revision their future? The second one, how can the selected person use digital storytelling and space to reclaim their identity? And the third one, can a community-based platform both online and offline of the LGBTQ person be created in South Korean, uh, in the South Korean context. And also, I would like also to share and uh, with you guys and you know, if you have ideas or you have experience with uh, this particular community, I'm also very interested to talk more to you guys. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Today, 
도시 분석 틀을 설계한다고 하는데요. 발표를 청해 듣도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jun Young Park, a fellow of Second IF 2020. Uh, you can see my face uh, here without mask. Uh, okay, I am very happy to share my story and my uh, research interest to my fellow researchers here and audiences from YouTube uh, through this opportunity. So, uh, let me begin my presentation. My presentation is uh, divided into three parts uh, that describe my career as an activist researcher and activist researcher. The uh, first part of my presentation is my uh, activist career. I lived in Indonesia from the year of 2012 until 2018. Uh, during that time, I organized a Korean immigrant civic group in 2016. Uh, so I participated in this group for two years. Uh, me and my team members did many various activities focused on the issues of peace, human rights of Indonesia, and Korean uh, social problems. So through these activities, uh, we tried to realize uh, the global trans transnational citizenships. Uh, let me continue to the next part, my career as a researcher. Now I am a graduate student uh, majored in geography at Seoul National University. Uh, so these are the uh, main uh, research concentrations, uh, uh, research concentrations, Southeast Asia regional uh, studies, uh, Korean immigrant, immigration, migrant studies, and urban studies. So below are the uh, research titles that I published, and some of them will be published soon. Uh, Okay, uh, this is the third and the last part of my presentation, uh, the activist researcher. So from now on, let me explain my research topic that I plan to do through this fellowship. Uh, as you can see from uh, the graph and the map on this slide, uh, we are now living in the era of urbanization. So almost 60% of people is now living in the urban spaces. Uh, and this proportion is expected to be increased. One urban geographer, Andy Merrifield, argued that modern society should be described through an urbanization, not a globalization. So we should consider the urban issues as a universal problem. That is, the problems of inequality or exclusion at the urban spaces are not a problem of certain regions. Thus, uh, based on this phenomenon, French philosopher Henri Lefebvre suggested the notion uh, of the right to the cities uh, as one of the important modern agendas. So after his suggestion, uh, urban rights are actively analyzed by many researchers. However, the studies are mainly focused on the Western developed cities. So most of the time, urban rights are discussed with uh, urban regeneration. So I think we need to develop or uh, expand this concept in order to adapt it to uh, the more uh, broader regions such as emerging cities in Asia. So my uh, research problem is started from here. What is the right to the right to the emerging cities of Asia. So in specific, I believe that uh, the humanities or philosophical considerations are needed to recreate uh, the concept which is adaptable for the emerging cities in Asia. Humanities uh, con consideration of subje subjectivity or the importance of uh, each body's rhythm will be added to an existing uh, concept to refine uh, the concept on my research. So below, uh, there are two pictures here. 
uh, the pictures of Jakarta, Indonesia. So my plan until now is a case study of Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, you can see some uh, uh, words on the left side of the slide. Uh, connections, uh, exclusions, equality, sustainability, rhythm. So these uh, words will be the main keywords of my uh, research. Uh, I am very passionate about my research topic, but I have a few concerns that need to be addressed. Uh, how can I address the youth issues, uh, youth problems, and how can I connect the problem, uh, urban problems of Seoul into my research that uh, has very different background and very different context from those of uh, Jakarta, Indonesia? Uh, I will improve my research by referring to the advice of other fellow researchers here. So please look forward to my uh, research research. This is all of my presentation. Thank you for listening. <웃음> 네, 다음에 소개해드릴 펠로우는 이소연 펠로우입니다. 이소연 펠로우는 어, 뉴스 매체에서 환경 에디터로 근무하고 있으면서. 어, 틈틈이 전국 백사장에 쓰레기를 줍는 활동을 하고 계신데요. 폐기물과 관련해서 시민들의 자발적 참여와 관심을 이끌어내는 데 깊이 꽂혀 있는 연구 활동가입니다. 이소연 펠로의 발표를 들어보겠습니다. 음, um, hi everyone. It is such an honor to be here with all of you guys and uh, it's good to see you over the YouTube streaming and I really want to thank you for all as an activist researcher as well. So um, I'm gonna give my presentation in three parts. First, I want to introduce myself, who I am, and want to share my two turning points in my life to be an activist researcher. And lastly, during IR for what I am looking forward to. So let's get started from um, what do I do? I am an editor and a project manager at a startup company, Munich. Uh, we are providing a newsletter service. It's basically by uh, briefing on uh, diverse current issues and international affairs in fun and easy way. Uh, and I am also a member of Sea Shepherd. It is an international marine conservation uh, organization. I love, um, I sometimes go to the beach and clean up the ocean, so I really like it. And uh, I'm kind of influencer. I mean, I some, uh, from time to time, I took, uh, I shared an advertising uh, from sponsored by uh, the eco-friendly companies who sells kind of vegan, um, vegan products or plastic-free bags, something like that. And actually, I want to be a super big influencer who strongly presents uh, their opinion or belief. Someone like um, Joaquin Phoenix or Jane Fonda, they they strongly uh, address their opinion. So I really want to be an influencer someday. And here is my first turning point in my life, reading Sapiens. It sounds a bit nerdy, I know, but the part that inspired me was all the path human beings pass through, animals, plants, and all ecosystems are, uh, had collapsed. It was so obvious fact and plain truth, but actually it did change my life. And I decide, uh, decided to do something as an activist to protect the earth and animals and plants. Uh, but you know what? Actually, it was so easy to be an activist because of this um, amazing and perfect environment surrounding me and our society. So my journey to be an activist just has just started like like this, with this um, shitty reality. I'm sorry for that, but yeah. So uh, first, I started with the tiny thing in my daily life, like bringing my own container when I have team lunch, and uh, kind of 
make a peer pressure to bring their own container to my coworkers and also try to make my voice louder on the street and draw some posters and attach it on the buildings and always want to try to do something in more creative way like bringing my signage uh, on the mountain or with the waterproof pack like bringing to the ocean something like that so in the middle of this interesting um, activist journey I had a chance um, to have a second turning point in my life which is an opportunity to work at a think tank uh, in a Washington DC as a research as assistant and actually at the first time I thought I'm it will gonna be um, boring I mean I'm not the type of research person so um, I feel it gonna be very boring but I found it uh, very intriguing actually when I uh, go over some documents or researches and build up my own perspectives or opinion on social issues. It was so excited. So I decided to start a small uh, research project about what I really care, um, the trash. And I'm gonna give you more details with this picture. Um, this is the first day uh, when I arrived in the United, United States for the first time and I still remember the moment that I ran into this trash can because it's really huge and large and I feel like I cannot I can't even hide into it and it's way larger than the ones in South Korea here and I think probably the size and the shape of this trash can is one of the reason uh, why uh, people in the United States they are they are throwing trash away without separating. So I just I was curious why would the uh, would the size and shape of public trash can affect people how to throw away? If we change the design or material or uh, the size, would this ultimately lead to a high recycling rate? So I begin my journey again. Um, I've been four different stages to check out uh, different types of state-designed trash can. For example, uh, the, on the right side for the first picture, it's the state of Pennsylvania designed recycle waste bins different by its use. A narrow round uh, shape for bottle or can a waste and rectangular shape for paper waste, something like that. But on the other hand, Washington DC for the first picture, the trash can is really huge and we want the big one without uh, other uh, bin for recycling. But at the end, I turned out the public, public trash can design had little to do with recycling rates but it was more about how much money and time uh, the state government spent having, uh, having effect on recycling rates. So it was kind of like I failed uh, on my first experience of project, a research project, but there's still uh, something that I've learned a lot. Uh, first one, unexpected independent variables, I mean, I'd never done before with uh, real research, so I didn't even know uh, what it is and how to control it. So I learned I have to prepare more, maybe check the uh, definition of recycling for each state. It was so different and there was lack of discussion uh, what uh, recycling uh, ratio means. And also I found I Maybe it could be a lack of my uh, research skills, but it was really hard to find related researches, especially on social issues and especially environmental issues. So uh, based on what I've learned, I came back to Seoul. And actually I expected to uh, extend, it, extend my project within uh, this society, 
but there is nothing to do for me because people in Korea, they are really good at recycling already. So I was thinking, as I mentioned before, uh, what is the definition of recycling and what does it mean they are good at recycling? Um, I mean, recycling system that only looks on the outside uh, is just as dangerous as the system of the United States, which they don't actually um, have any strict rule of uh, weight sorting. But, uh, and actually it turned out it's true, like we are good at recycling, but at the same time we are, we are not. Uh, like half of plastic bottle, just only half of plastic bottle uh, can be recycling and uh, among 10 paper cups, only one can be recycled, something like that. So I tried to figure out how to solve this problem uh, with you guys. I, like, I couldn't find the answer by myself, so that's why I'm here. So through IRV, I want to uh, do my research based on social perceptions and reality. Uh, like you guys saw uh, through my presentation, uh, based on which society we are, uh, it could be so different, even my uh, project, my subject of my project. So I want to make a behavior change which can bring real impact on the society in fun and easy way because I'm kind of good at it. Uh, and this is an example of what I plan for experiments. Now we have, sometimes we have um, like security camera and guard when we uh, go out to, for recycling. And actually we, even without it, we are just willing to uh, do weight sorting. I don't know why, but we are. So what if, if we put on signage, maybe somewhere around there, and maybe it will gonna be about um, maybe policy uh, for company ban to stop a uh, ban to use plastic vinyl, which can lead we don't even have to do weight sorting. So rather than just um, do uh, weight sorting and feel like okay I'm done and I'm good, I want to make more uh, people participate in uh, our issues and get involved in this reality. So make people think and maybe gather out together or send an email or they make a uh, voice uh, louder, something like that. And lastly, I want to uh, share my future plan with you guys. I want to be an uh, activist researcher who propose appropriate communication strategies uh, in terms of social issues Maybe it depends on which group we are targeting, like government, private sector, or public. And it would be different based on which uh, social and cultural background we are, and different masters depending on the topic. So I was talking about uh, the waste management, but it would be totally different if, uh, when it comes to a Green New Deal or um, data, things like that. So. Um, thank you so much, and I was so thrilled to share my ideas, thoughts during the last two days, and we also have six days more to be together, so I hope we can have an amazing experience together, and thank you so much. <웃음> 네, 이제 마지막 발표 순서입니다. 모두들 주거공간 청년 협동조합에서 활동하고 있는 장종민, 장은실 펠로우인데요. 어, 2013년부터 청년 주거 문제 해결을 위해 만들어진 협동조합으로 주거 문제를 사회적으로 알리고 또 함께 거주하면서 새로운 주거 문화를 실험해 오고 있다고 합니다. 네, 그럼 마지막 발표를 청해 듣겠습니다. Uh, hello everyone, um, my name is uh, Jongmin Chang and I am activist of uh, Modudur Youth Housing um, Cooperative. I um, participated in uh, this fellowship program uh, with uh, Eunsil as uh, team Modudur. So I'm going to uh, explain, I'm going to show what Modudur Youth Housing Cooperative is and 
uh, our current concern. Um, Mododo has been started as a group of young people who has been uh, struggling to be their own because the price of housing houses uh, too expensive. So, uh, so Mododo made first a share house in 2013, uh, and then and then was established as um, cooperative in 2014. Um, while we are doing um, our activity, we real realized that um, there were many young people who had been struggled to struggle uh, same issues. So we thought uh, we need to make uh, more share houses. Uh, also, uh, we got an opportunity to use uh, local communities resources, so we could make uh, more uh, houses um, through citizen investment and um, other many helps, and also make uh, our own uh, community. Uh, but the way of uh, managing um, house, share house didn't give us um, enough um, profit to run our organization, so the activists had to uh, do uh, extra work uh, all the time. So there was a concern about the structure to make a decent profit. And then we get, we get a chance to do a consigned uh, management, the social housing, which is a uh, one room based house for young people. Uh, as a result, um, uh, sufficient uh, revenue began to be uh, generated for the operation of the organization. Since it was uh, one of one of the earlier version of uh, social housing uh, to be built, there was no consideration for community or uh, shared spaces. So the house was run without a community room. So therefore, there were um, communities in a different way than our share houses, uh, which were based on, on economic issues, uh, such as uh, group buying or uh, self uh, improvement community. Uh, yeah, and then there, there was an opportunity to uh, participate in the bu building uh, new social housing from very uh, beginning stage of design. Uh, although uh, it wasn't an, it wasn't the area we are not used to do uh, activity. We have an, an expectations that it would be able to build our house for. Uh, single person uh, household use. As a result, um, the entire three story old house was uh, remodeled to create a new house consisting of a community room on the first floor and a residential spaces on the second and third floor. Uh, as we operate a uh, various type of um, residential spaces, our worries seems to be deepening and um, expanding. The first share house model to secure uh, stability of housing through low housing cost. And second one, one room based social housing uh, model that has secured um, organizational uh, sustainability while uh, promoting a uh, relationship with more than uh, 40 residents. And a uh, third uh, share house type uh, social housing model uh, designed for a single person household youth. Um, in addition to the initial concern that the people who live or want to live in a house should be able to set housing cost and create housing culture, our current concern is how to read and utilize the uh, environment and the market, especially the, uh, especially the in, uh, improving the share house type social housing model. The reason why this problem is important is that uh, the house and a person are not uh, just standing on a uh, blank sheet. Knowing how much young people can uh, interact with or um, actively organizing uh, surrounding environment uh, living uh, infrastructure or and the community network would be a concern for um, housing and life. So we hope uh, this fellowship program will uh, deep and enrich our concern and ways to solve uh, the problems. Um, in addition, um, I hope that 
uh, there will be a full experience that solving problems that um, cannot be handled alone uh, with the other fellows. Thank you. Uh, 네, 이제 이렇게 총 17명의 펠로의 모든 발표가 끝났습니다. 이렇게 처음부터 끝까지 현장에서 그리고 온라인으로 함께 해주신 모든 분들께 진심으로 감사 인사드립니다. 어, 이렇게 제2회 급진적 미래 컨퍼런스는 막을 내리지만 17명 펠로우의 여정은 오늘부터 시작입니다. 어, 향후 10일간 세미나와 워크숍, 리서치 활동을 통해서 세상의 한 편을 바꿔나갈 17명의 펠로우에게 아낌없는 응원과 격려를 부탁드립니다. 네, 오늘 세션에 참가하신 어, 관객들께서도 사전에 귀한 의견들을 많이 주셨는데요. 어, 예를 들면 오늘 컨퍼런스 이후에 네트워크 그와 연대 방안에 대한 질문도 있었고요. 그 다음에 농업 그리고 비건 장애인 의제에 대한 촉구도 있었습니다. 어, 이 의견들은 IF 기획자들 그리고 펠로우들께도 어, 좋은 참고 사항이 되었습니다. 의견 주셔서 감사드립니다. IF는 시민들과 함께하는 프로그램인데요. 어, 오늘 외에도 참여의 자리가 많이 남아 있습니다. 29일 토요일 오드리탕 대만 디지털 특임 장관께서 진행하시는 온라인 워크샵이 있고요. 1기 펠로우의 게릴라 세션 그리고 2기 펠로우의 열린 제안 등이 유튜브 중계로 어, 진행될 예정입니다. 어, 관련된 정보는 어, 아예 홈페이지를 많이 참조해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 어, 그럼 이것으로 제2회 급진적 미래 컨퍼런스를 마치도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다.